video series in which I go over older board game gems, gems that aren't really talked about much anymore. And as you can see, the game I'm covering in this video is Elfenland, otherwise known as Elfin Roads. Now there's a history there. The game was designed by Alan R. Moon, who is most famous for Ticket to Ride, and you might consider Elfenland to be a little bit of a predecessor to Ticket to Ride. At least it has some of the root building elements, but in the end they're not very similar games, I feel. Anyway, Alan Moon had his own company, uh, his own publishing company called White Wind. This company would publish games, including one called Elfin Roads, came out in the early 90s. Uh, it was a bit long. It was a little bit thinky. Right? There were auctions. This so was, a, you know, something that could really cater to uh, to the hobbyist mindset. That was in the early 90s. And in the late 90s, 98, came Elfenland, which can be considered to be kind of a simpler, shorter version of Elfin Roads. Uh, the, the game was shrunk, so the board was not as big. Uh, the, it got rid of the auctions. And the whole thing would take maybe about an hour instead of the 90 minutes to two hours. Although that is really dependent on number of players. Anyway, Elfenland won the Spiel des Jahres, the, the game of the year in 1998. So it had an expansion, Elfen Gold. The Elfen Gold expansion does bring this game closer to the original, that it brings back the money aspect, brings back the auctions. Still the same board. Um, and that's a little bit confusing, too, because actually Alan Moon's White Wind Company published a different game called Elfin Gold. So it's, it's, it, it gets a bit confusing with the different names. The expansion for a while was really hard to find. I'm not sure about now, because in the mid-2010s, we had this edition, Elfin Roads, which was called, I believe, Elfenland Deluxe in Germany. And this version here which yeah, only came out maybe five or so years ago, has the original Elfin Land, plus the Elfin Gold expansion, plus on the back of the board, you have a different map. This is kind of the definitive edition. Um, it has all new artwork, but this is Doris Mateus artwork and I'm a fan. So Elfin Land is for, I think technically two to six players. I've never played it with two. I can't imagine wanting to play it with two, but if you love, love, love the game, probably you'd still like to play it with two because it's a chance to play a game you love, right? And even same with three. I'm not a big fan of it with three players. Generally speaking, the more players there are, the more interesting it gets, but it also makes the game longer. So I would say the, the perfect number is probably four players, maybe even five, but six player games can take a while. The box says 60 minutes, again, dependent on number of players. A six-player game could potentially be about twice as long as a three-player game. Although there are also, in different editions, different numbers of rounds you can play. So in this edition, they, the default is a full four rounds. And in this edition, they shrunk it to three rounds, with the fourth round being an optional variant. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And the box says ages 10 and up. Fairly fair, I think. You can play it with younger kids, and this artwork in particular, I think, is quite charming for, for kids. Um, Ticket to Ride is 8 and up. Is this more complicated? Maybe yes, but not by much. So I'm going to show you how it plays. I'm going to use this edition because this is the most recent one. And actually, this is just a box. I don't have the original anymore. Um, the board is, I think I took the board, because the game was wrecked, it was missing pieces. So I took the board and I put it up on the wall in my restaurant as kind of board game art. So this is just an empty box, but <laughs> so I'm going to go over this one. Uh, I'll show you how to play Elfin Land. There is an expansion and an alternate uh, board, which I'm not going to get into. Just going to show you the basic game, and I'll tell you whether it's still a gem today. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players and decide how many rounds you're going to play. Um, in the original, the standard game was four rounds. In Elfin Roads, the rules suggest a three round game with four rounds as a variant. So decide at the beginning whether to do three or four rounds and place that many cards in a stack in the corner of the board. So everybody can see what round it is. It is round one. Each player gets a boot, 
which will start on Elfin Golds. So that's where they're going to start. It's going to be moving around the board. Markers. In the old edition, they were kind of barrels, circular barrels, which tended to roll around. In this edition, they're cubes. Each player has 20. This edition has more than necessary for the basic game. So each player is going to take 20 of their markers and place them on each of the 20 cities' locations on the board, excluding Elfin Gold, where they start. And each player also starts with one obstacle, which they'll put in front of them. Also give every player a player aid, which I'll explain shortly. Shuffle up the deck of travel cards. Now, I don't have room in this shot to show these. The board is very large and it takes up all the all the space on uh, in my camera. But there's also going to be these travel tokens. And you'll see there's several different types which correspond to the types on the player aid. You're going to mix all of those face down and then place a display of five face up somewhere near the board. Of course, I'm going to be putting this on the board because, again, I don't have a lot of room. I'm going to go ahead and set it up for a three-player game. In Elfenland, the goal is to visit as many cities as possible. Whenever you visit a city that you haven't yet visited, you will get to take the marker in that city of your color and put it in front of you. By the end of the game, the player who's collected the most of their colored cubes wins the game. So you're trying to visit as many cities as possible. You're going to be traveling along these paths, as well as along the river and over the lakes. And to do that, you are going to need travel cards. There's a player aid which shows the various types of travel and how many travel cards you need of that type in order to travel using that form of transportation. So for example, the top row is a giant pig. You only need one giant pig card to travel along grassland or forest, but the giant pig cannot travel on other types of terrain. There's the elf cycle, which can also travel on mountains, but you need two elf cycle cards in order to travel in the mountains. And the reminders of these are also on the card. So you'll see one symbol for grassland, one symbol for forest, and there's two symbols, two circles, for mountains. So there's six different forms of transportation requiring various different numbers of cards of that type to travel, and some cannot travel at all. For example, the unicorns cannot travel on grassland, I would think that would be a thing they could do, but apparently not. And the giant cloud and the elf cycle cannot travel in the desert. In addition, there are also raft cards. Now, there are no raft tokens. You use raft cards to travel on water. In the top row is a little bit confusing, <laughs> but the top row says that in order to travel on a river, you need one card if you're traveling with the direction of the arrows. So in the direction of the river flow. To travel the opposite direction against the river flow, you need two raft cards. And you also need two raft cards to travel along a lake from any one of the three cities bordering that lake to any of the other three cities bordering that same lake. At the start of the round, shuffle up the deck and give each character eight travel cards. And of course, determine a start player. This is a start player marker. There's three sort of phases of a round. One, the first phase is claiming these transportation markers. The second phase is placing them on the board and the third phase is playing your travel cards to travel along those routes. By the end of your turn, your boot may be in a completely different location, and that's where you'll start in the start of the next round. So starting with the start player, each player is going to claim three tokens, one at a time.
When you claim a token, you claim any one of the five face-up tokens or a blind one that's face down. After you claim one, it's immediately replaced with a new token. Then it's the next player's turn. And when it's your turn again, you're going to take another token. And you're going to do this three times. At the end of this phase of the first round, you will have three face-up tokens as well as one face-down token. And you don't have to play them all this round. You can save one for a future round. So next round, maybe you'll have five at the end of this phase. Then is the next phase where players take turns placing the tokens on the board. Players can place any one of their tokens, including the face down one. Of course, they would then reveal it. And they would take that token and they would place it on any path on the board that doesn't already have a token and that that form of transportation is able to travel. So the elf cycle cannot travel on desert, so you are not allowed to place the elf cycle on a desert, but you can place it anywhere else. If you place it here, then that means that this round, in order to travel from this town to this town or vice versa, you will need to play one elf cycle travel card because you only need one to travel via elf cycle through the forest. If there's an elf cycle token in this mountain pass here, then a player traveling between these two towns would need to play two mountain cards. Each path can only have at most one token, and that defines the mode of transportation that's allowed between those two cities that round. At the end of this phase, any paths that don't have a token cannot be traveled at all. So players are going to take turns putting their tokens on an empty path somewhere on the board. Or you can pass. If you pass and it comes back around to you, you can jump back in. But when all players have passed consecutively, this phase is over. In addition, you can also play your obstacle token. You can only place an obstacle token on a path that already has a travel token. And then you would add to it, maybe something like that. What the obstacle token does is requires anybody traveling along this path to play one extra card. So now in order to travel this path, you need two elf cycle cards instead of just one. Each path can only have one obstacle. Players can't gang up and put a bunch of obstacles on the same path. And that's a one time use. At the end of the round, the obstacle goes away. You don't get a replacement. That's one time use for the whole game. After all players have passed consecutively, it's the end of that phase, and now it's time for traveling. And to do this, I'm going to throw up some uh, kind of random tokens here. They can't be completely random because, uh, <laughs> because um, not all of these tokens will work everywhere. But just so you can kind of see what's, uh, what's going on. Of course, at the end of this phase, there will generally be more tokens on the board. But I just put out a few so you can see how the next phase works for a single player. Again, starting with the start player, each player now is going to move around the board. And to do that, they're going to play travel cards. So what's an example of a move here? A player, if they had it in their hand, they could do this, for example. They could play a raft card to go up the river. To travel in forest requires one card, so they could play, so they could play a giant pig to travel along here. Of course, each time they're taking the tokens as they travel. Maybe they have another giant pig, which they play to come up here. Now they need an elf cycle to travel here, but let's suppose they don't have an elf cycle. Instead, they can play any three cards from their hand as sort of a wild. They play three cards from their hand to travel to here. See, they want to go here, but there's no token. So instead they're going to go back to here first, then they're going to play a dragon card to come back here, take this token, and the last card they cannot play. If they had another dragon card, they could travel to here and take this token. 
but they don't. They only had eight cards, they just played seven. The eighth card that they have is not a dragon, so they can't play anymore, so they stop there. And this round they've collected four tokens, they've visited four cities. So starting in the next round, they're going to start from this location. After every player has moved their boot, all tokens that are on the board get removed. Players can keep at most one transportation token that they had collected in an earlier round, whether it's the face down one that they got at the beginning of the game or one that they drew later, but they can keep at most one and then they do a new round, round two, which starts just like the first round with drawing a hand of transportation cards, taking turns, taking transportation tokens, placing them on the board, allowing them to travel to new cities. And you're going to do that three times in a three round game or four times in a four round game. At the end of the game, the player who collected the most cubes of their color, that is to say the player who visited the most towns on the board, wins the game. In the case of a tie, the player who has the most cards remaining in their hand breaks the tie. It is possible, however very challenging, to get all 20 of your cubes. If you do that before the end of the third round, you win the game outright. That's it, you're ready to play Elfenland. I'll say up front, I haven't played this game a ton. Uh, I've played it maybe two, three, four times years ago. Hadn't played it recently, however, uh, in the OG Guild, and if you like some of the games that I cover on this channel, and you're on Board Game Geek, you should definitely consider joining the Guild, the OG Guild, where we talk about old-school German-style games, of which Elfenland is one. And a Guild member had the idea to have a game every month that basically as many of us play as possible so we can kind of talk about it and, and discuss it. And the very first one for September of 2021 was Elfenland. So I was able to play it twice recently on Board Game Arena. That's where you can find it if you want to play it online. It can play up to six players. I don't really recommend that because the game would take a really long time. Although I will say, and I do appreciate this, the board is really big. I really don't like games that say they play it to six players, but they give you a small little board. <laughs> Definitely there's going to be people who are not sitting close to the board and they're not going to feel invested in the game. It's just like something's happening over there. I don't really care. Right. So if a game that can play a lot of players should have a big board and this one does. So that's good. But I still wouldn't recommend playing it with six players. I just feel like the game would take a really long time. I think four is probably ideal, but I would say that five players is better than three. So four, then five, and then maybe three and six. Maybe even six is better than three. Um, I've played six-player games in the past, and I've enjoyed it. It's just the game has taken a long time, right? <laughs> so I'll say four or five players is probably best. I haven't played a game quite like it. It's, it's somewhat unique that way. And you know what? You have Ticket to Ride, and you have lots of route-building games of uh, varying complexity. Of course, you have lots of train games like 18xx, which is a genre that I don't think I'm ever going to get into. Just the... The, maybe the games are amazing, but most of them would take far too long for me to be interested in them. But cube rail games are really great. So there's lots of route building games out there, but this one feels very different because it's not like you're building permanent routes for like a pick up and deliver kind of thing. Everything is very temporary, right? You're playing, you have your hand of cards, which is random that you get at the start of your round. And you have a little bit of control on which tokens to get. And then you're choosing to put them on the board, but you're putting them in the way of the other players. Um, it's a bit interactive that way, but it's interactive in the sense of you're stepping on each other's toes, right? Our, our pawns are close to each other. We both want to go this way. The first person to you know, put a token there will get to choose what form of transportation. And it can really mess you up, right? It's like, I was really, really hoping to get you know a, a giant pig to go that way, but instead they dropped this elf cycle there and I don't have elf, elf cycle cards, so I have to figure something out, right? you're in a shared space and you're trying to do what you want to do and you are inevitably going to get in the way of other players. You are planning from the start of the round 
and then planning your route as best you can and your plan will have to change as you know the tokens you want don't come up or you know other players are putting tokens on in a path that you intended to take but you don't have cards of that type so that can mess you up maybe i should do a caravan three cards of anything but then i have fewer cards to go somewhere else right um i don't really know another game like it so it's unique that way and i enjoy it every time i play it's interactive also because of the obstacles and this is this is kind of an old school style of interaction and it's not one that i'm a huge fan of so each player has an optical token that they can use once per game to make one route between two cities for one round more difficult to traverse. So there's a couple of ways I see this used, but it's always kind of punitive, right? It's not like necessarily a strategic move. It's like an ah, gotcha kind of move, right? One player's in the lead. Last round comes, if it's a fairly big lead, you can expect all the other players who still have obstacles to try to make that player's life as difficult as possible. At which point the second player, the person who's in second place has a better chance of winning, right? Or it's like a revenge kind of thing where you know the first person to put their obstacle down to hit somebody, what does that player do? Immediately plays their obstacle and hurts the player who hurt them, right? <laughs> Um, so the obstacles are kind of weird that way. Uh, one Another way I, I've seen the obstacles used is because there's one city that has only one way in or out. Everything else has two or three or more paths in and out of the city, but there's one city that just has one. And if one player moves into that city and ends their turn there, then it's very tempting to place the obstacle there so that they have a hard time getting out again, right? So... But in general, it's a very old style of interaction. It's it's literally take that. Now, it's not super painful. It's not like, oh, I missed your turn, right? It just means needing an extra card. But that can be huge in this game, actually, right? If you have two of something and that's enough to get you through the path and suddenly you need three, you don't have control over the cards in your hand, right? You might simply not have three. Then you have to do, what, a caravan? And then that's going to need, like, four cards then because it's normally three as a wild plus one for the obstacle that player is not moving very far this round so that's kind of a weird thing you wouldn't really see much of that uh, often anymore but it is fun for a mix of kids and adults right take that can work in families right the kids you know can punish the adults take an obstacle put it in front of the of the adults right and have a big laugh i tell you that last round oh if players were saving their obstacles for the last round, that last round is going to be a bloodbath. Obstacles all over the place, hardly anybody moving around, and you do not want to be a leader going into that last round. Holy cow, everybody's just going to gang up on you. The game was originally four rounds. This version, Elfinland, was four rounds. That last round in a four-round game, because there's often very few markers left, you have no choice as to where to go right it's like oh all of my remaining cubes are in the desert i have to go through the desert and if the cards you get don't really help you in the desert or the tokens that end up in those paths are not what you need to get to the desert you're kind of hosed but it does create some uncertainty in that last round so this edition the newest edition defaults it to three rounds now on paper that's great for one thing makes the game shorter right? And secondly, that last round, you really feel the randomness in the fourth round because you have a small area that you have to go. And so it's really dependent on the cards you get and the tokens end up there. The third round is really the last round where you have choices of where to go and makes the game shorter, right? Maybe the game's a little repetitive. So making it shorter is not a bad thing, especially if you're playing with six players. So like on paper, it makes a lot of sense to make it a three round game, but there's something psychological about being, feeling close to getting everything, but not quite. <laughs> Where he's like, oh, I ended up just short. I only have, you know, did a really, like in, in Elfinland, if you have a really, really good game, you might get like 19 of your 20 markers, right? And you feel really, really good about that. It's like you were so close to getting all 20 kind of thing, right? And it is possible to get 20. But 19 is like a really good game, right? 
And there's a satisfaction there when you're able to to do that really well. There's just to me, there's just something psychological about aiming to get all of them and just coming up short that kind of feeds that center of your brain that makes you want to try again, right? Whereas three rounds, because the fourth, maybe it's because the fourth round is just so different because the three rounds, the first three rounds are really repetitive and the fourth round feels very different. And so it feels kind of more like a climax. Um, but, you know, I can see the pros and cons of both. Um, shorter game, very reasonable. Um, having that last, the last round not be like, I have to go here. So you're less reliant on the luck makes a lot of sense. And it's just a psychological thing in my head that the four, the four rounds feel a little more satisfying, but your mileage may vary, right? Um, I would probably even go so far for your first game, at least you're introducing to people who haven't played before, tell them up front. It's like, we're going to play three rounds and see how people feel, you know, and if we like it, we'll play a fourth round. And if we don't like it, we'll stop after three, right? If they like it, they'll, I would guess they'll probably want to play the fourth round because they can see the small number of cubes that are left, you know, four, five, six or something. And it's like, I might be able to get all those. I'm, you know, I'm going to try, right? Anyway, your mileage may vary. My complaint about fantasy settings and board games is that it, it makes it a harder. It puts a little obstacle tile between you and internalizing the game rules. And it seems like for most hobbyists, not a problem at all. And they just like fantasy, so it's worth that tiny obstacle. But I notice the obstacle is there. And I think for a lot of people, that obstacle is there and they don't even notice it. But it just, there's some something that keeps you from internalizing the rules. And I think Elfenland is a good example of that because there are several different modes of transportation. Giant pig, all right. A cart pulled by trolls, I think. Okay. Elf cycle? Is that a thing? I never heard of an elf cycle before. And a magic cloud. Why not? But how do they each move? It's not easy to internalize which um, landscapes each mode of transportation works on and works well on because some require one card and some require two. And some don't work at all. You can't use that transportation at all unless it's part of a three-card wild, a caravan. But that's not intuitive, right? So some of them make sense, like, you know, a magic cloud on mountains. Okay, I, I get that, right? You're kind of flying over the mountains. I think the dragon is good on mountains as well. But it's like the unicorn. The unicorn can work everywhere except grassland. Why not grassland? Don't think about it too much. It doesn't have to make sense. It's fantasy. That's kind of the problem I have with fantasy, right? So in this game, you get this chart and it has the several different modes of transportation and which ones are allowed to be used on which terrains and which terrains you need just one card or you need two cards. And it's not super, super intuitive unless you play the game a lot. Players, new players are constantly checking the chart, trying to remember like what what works well where and that and it's just not intuitive at all. But that's what you get with a fantasy setting, isn't it? You can do whatever you want. You can have elf cycles. Yeah, but where do elf cycles work? Do they work in the mountains? Do they work in the forests? I don't know. There's nothing in the real world that would help me remember elf cycles work here or there, right? Is just made up. So, okay, but I don't know what that made up thing is, so I have to constantly check the chart, right? It seems like I'm one of the few people who has a problem with this. Most hobbyists don't have a problem with the obstacle in internalizing rules that can come about from a fantasy setting. It seems to be I'm relatively special that way. So maybe you don't have a problem. But it's something I have a problem with. Thought I'd mention it. I won't say it's a huge, huge deal. Each player has a little player aid, and it's pretty easy to look down at it. It prevents you from internalizing it, but if you have a player aid, maybe you don't need to internalize it. Just 
always look at that, right? This is not really anything to do with elephant land, but another thing that kind of, I feel like in modern times, at the time of recording, uh, is a big thing that people, hobbyists, demand in games is multiple paths to victory. And it seems a very easy complaint to make of games that don't offer multiple paths to victory. The problem is sometimes those multiple paths to victory are just ridiculous. In this game, this game has no multiple paths to victory, all right? I mean, it has literally multiple paths <laughs> that you can take to work toward victory, but they all connect up. Right? Um, but yeah, you have multiple routes to take, but you have one goal, right? You have one job. Visit as many cities as possible. How do you do that? And for a modern hobbyist, this game wouldn't have multiple paths to victory. They'd be happy if there was a way you could win where you didn't have to visit any city. You just stay in the capital, Elphia, and build elf cycles. <laughs> and you get points for every elf cycle you make, and maybe you win that way, right? So you have somebody playing a completely different game that's, you know, I understand that a lot of hobbyists don't like it when players have to interact, you know? I want to do my plan. I want to, to optimize everything. And these other players affect you. Yes. Yes, they're the ultimate randomizer, fighting against other players. You're all trying to do the same thing and you're getting to each other's way. What's wrong with that? I just think it would be funny to have multiple paths to victory in, in this game, right? Just stay home. Stay home, never travel a single road, just make elf boots and rack up points that way. <laughs> so there's a few variants and expansions. I talked a little bit about the, the variant about three rounds versus four rounds. So one that comes with the game is, I think they call it the hometown variant. So the idea is players draw a random card at the start of the game, which shows one of the cities in Elflandia, Elfinlandia. And at the end of the game, you're trying to get as close to your hometown as possible. And whatever your score is, you, because higher score is better, you subtract from that how many cities you would have to travel through to get to your hometown. So if you land on your hometown, that's zero. But if you're just one away, you would subtract one. I personally could take it or leave it. A lot of people swear by it. The main advantage to me is it varies up those end game scores a little bit. And, you know, going into that last round, you can see who's winning. You don't know what hometown they have. Maybe their hometown ends up being super far away, right? So it adds a little bit of variability at the end um, and varies up the scores a bit. So it's a really neat, very simple uh, expansion, very simple variant. Works great. Uh, I would guess probably after your first game, if you're going to play it many times, probably use the hometown variant every time. I can't talk about the Elfin Gold expansion all that much. In terms, uh, I can't talk about it from my personal experience. I have never played with the Elfin Gold expansion. And although it's appealing to me, the idea to make Elfin Land a more gamer's game, um, it's not something I personally look for. I will say this. I love it, love it, love it when a designer or publisher or together decide to make not a gamer's game, not a complicated game, but make a simpler family game and have an expansion that makes it more involved. And that allows players to kind of customize the game experience to the level of complexity that they're looking for. Between you and me, don't tell anybody else, just you and me now. I think there should be far, far fewer complex board games out there. I think the vast majority of them can and should be streamlined, simplified. It doesn't have to be like family level, right? Like to, so little kids can play, but it should be playable by anyone who has an interest in it. And there are some games that come out that are just so crazy complex. They're obviously just for hobbyists, right? You would never introduce a, a non-gamer or casual gamer friend to, to play one of these games. But if you introduce it as a base game plus an expansion, 
that's the best of both worlds, right? So you got the base game. If you're playing with people who haven't played before, you just play the base game. Maybe for some people, base game's all you need. You're completely happy with it. But if you play it a lot and you get tired of it, you can throw in the expansion, add more things to think about. Or if you just like more complicated games in general, throw in the expansion off the bat, make it more interesting for you. Customize the gameplay experience for you and your and your group. I love that Elfin Land did that because you had Elfin Roads, not this one, the original. You had Elfin Roads, which was kind of long and I don't know how complicated it was, but it was definitely a thinky experience. And instead, it kind of broke it up into base game plus expansion. Perfect, right? A lot of people would be perfectly happy with the base game, but if you want a more thinky experience, they throw the expansion in there. Now, what does the expansion do? Well, it adds money. So players get income and they can buy things they need. But what do they buy? They buy, for example, the tokens that they need, and it's via auction, right? So they, they bid on the tokens they need. I don't mind auctions at all, but it can slow the game down a lot, right? You have a game like Santiago. Every round there's an auction, but it's once a round. You have one bid, and then based on your bid, you're getting something. You're doing one auction for one round every round. And when you have auctions, which are, you know, you're going around and around and you're doing it multiple times every round, oh, it can really slow the game down. So I'm still really curious to try it, but I think I would only try it with three or four players. I think usually auctions don't work well with three, but because the game would be shorter anyway, I think I could tolerate a bit of extra length to it by adding the auctions. Um... But for five or six players, I don't think I would be willing to try that. I just think the experience would be way too long. Just my opinion. Like I said, I haven't played that expansion. My gut feeling is probably with three or four players, I might prefer it with the expansion. And then five or six players, I'd prefer to have it without the expansion, just to have the game flow a little bit faster. Um, but uh, I am curious to try that expansion. So that expansion, which used to be hard to find for this edition... Um, comes with this edition. So this is kind of the definitive edition of the game because it's got that, the base game, it's got the expansion, and it's got a double-sided board. So now you got a whole new map to play with, with a new uh, transportation type, a whale, because it's you're on the sea now, you're on the, the seaside. I haven't played the back of that board. I, I'm sorry, is this a bad video? <laughs> this has so much stuff in it, and I was like, yeah, I haven't played most of it. <laughs> So I'm sorry, uh, I'm just talking about what I want to talk about. And like I said, I've played this game a couple times recently for the guild, and so now's a good time to talk about it. But I have not played the expansion, I haven't played the backside board. Um, I love the fact that there's variety in there. The box is much thicker. Not necessary either. I mean, it's the same size board, right? It's just double-sided. They didn't need to make the box so much thicker to to uh, accommodate the, that uh, those uh, expansion items. That's not needed. It's not necessary. And of course, we have to talk about the art difference because this is Doris Mateus and this is not. I apologize. I don't know who the artist is for this. In some ways, and I apologize, but in some ways, it almost feels like it doesn't matter so much in this case who the artist is because this style could be applied to lots of different games and the games don't really stand out very much. This one is bright and colorful and this one's darker and more... It feels a bit more generic to me anyway. I feel like this is a bit more charming. The, if you watch the How to Play part, or if you haven't, go back and check it out, right? The board. Look at the board. The grass is yellowish green and the forest is yellowish green but it's slightly darker than the grass and in this one the colors are bright and they stand out so i actually have in terms of the art style i have a strong preference for this one look uh, we talked about it in the saint petersburg video yes i do like doris mateus's art and i don't understand why more you know more recent hobbyists seem to poo poo her work they want something that they might find in like an illustrated young adult novel or something like that would be better for them. Um, but it all comes down to practicality. Like I don't want an abstract game. So I'm glad that it's a map with desert and forest and mountains and stuff. But 
have everything stand out, right? Have the colors really pop. So when you have this thing, you know, okay, that's dark green. That's the forest. I can take that on forest. This one, it does pop. It does stand out. And this one, the colors are washed out, I guess. Is that the right way to describe it? So I'm actually not a fan of the board. The rest of the art is completely fine and good. I mean, look, I'm happy that it comes with like a bunch of the expansion stuff and the, the extra map. So this is the definitive version. But probably if I was to have Elfin Land for my permanent collection, I think the what I, I would like the most would probably be the, um, the most recent Amigo Standard Edition, which is like an Agricola size box. So it's like, you know, rectangular, but it would be about half the size of this. You know, like like this, but maybe just a tiny bit thicker. Um, save less space, right? Save more space. Save space. But I mean, obviously you got the expansion stuff. The, the Elf and Gold expansion was hard to find. I don't know about now, but it certainly has been in the past. So, you know, if you're going to get Elf and Land, check the art on this. If you think the art on the board is fine, and if you don't mind a massive box... I mean, they're the same size area, but this one is much thicker. Not quite, but almost twice as thick. Maybe like 1.6 times, 1.7 times, something like that. It seems that way anyway. So if you're okay with a big box and you like the look of the board, yeah, there's nothing to stop you from getting this one. This one is very good for what you get. Like, it, it's, it's, the, it's the definitive edition, for sure, right? And if you can get it for a reasonable price, go for it. Um, if you can't get this one for a reasonable price, don't worry about the expansion content so, so much. Uh, don't worry about getting the old version of Elfin Land and maybe get a more recent Amigo edition in the smaller box, if, especially if you're in Europe. Um, you can probably get that pretty easily, and that would be the way to go. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to keep this for my permanent collection. I like the game, but the box is kind of big, and most of my gaming is three-player. And... You know, it's nice that this game plays up to six. Definitely for a big collection, you don't want more of the same. You want some some games that bring you a different experience. And Elfin Land is a unique experience. It's hard to say whether it stands up now to um, to kind of more modern tastes for modern hobbyists and what they're looking for in a game. I think. At least base Elfin Land is probably going to be a tough sell. Watch a how to play, get a feel for it, read some comments on Board Game Geek from people who like the game and who hate the game, and get a feel for whether it might be a good fit for you. Um, if you're in Europe, it should be, I think, really easy to find uh, Elfin Land and probably pretty cheap, so pretty easy to give it a try if you're interested. Um, so, yeah, it's a unique game. You may want to check it out. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Elfenland don't necessarily stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.